pray. Father, do open our eyes and hearts now as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, John 1.45. This is where we are this morning. John uh, chapter 1, verse 45. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith unto him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than these. And he and he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So this is a section that so far we've seen that Christ is gathering together his disciples who are going to serve him. They, these disciples are going to yield their minds to Christ. They're going to yield their hearts to Christ. They're going to yield their feet. They're going to yield their hands, their mouths. And he is going to come inside of them by his spirit, and he's going to guide their minds. He's going to guide their hearts, guide their feet, guide their hands, and have the, 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 so that they'll have the mind of Christ, they'll have the heart of Christ, and then he'll use their feet, he'll use their mouths to do his will. That's who Christ was on the search for. He was on the hunt for those who would yield to him so he could fill them, so he could use them in this world. And we've seen how Christ, on this search for, 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 for these people, had these words in, in, in verse 43, verse 43, go forth. The, the, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and finds Philip and say it to him, follow me. And the disciples that Jesus was looking for were the ones who would accept his invitation. They were going to follow him and, and were immediate in their response to follow him. So there was really a test. It was really a simple test and it separa separated out the, 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 the followers of Christ, because he was looking at the test, was like this. Verse 39, verse 39. He saith unto them, come and see. They came and saw. It was just boom. Right after the invitation, they responded. And Christ knew that he found his followers when he threw out that challenge to come and see. And immediately, no hesitation, they respond. True followers of Christ say to the invitation of Christ, there's no better time than now to obey and to follow Christ. True followers of Christ, when they hear Christ invite or command, they strike when the iron is hot. True followers of Christ, they embrace this word now in 2 Corinthians 6 2. 2 Corinthians 6 2 would say it, He saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted in the day of salvation, have I helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So this is, this is what he's looking for. He's looking for those who will, who will say what David said in Psalms 27, 8, Psalm 27, 8. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. So these are the true followers of Christ. They're not afraid to fail. They just step out. They're like Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth had his most strikeouts in the same year that he had his most home runs because he wasn't afraid to fail. True followers of Christ, they swing the bat. And so this, this is what was seen in verse 39 on that day when Christ invited them to come and see that it was on the same day at the same time that they, they came and saw. And this shows the difference between head belief and heart faith. Head belief and heart faith. Heart faith has confidence in Christ. Heart faith has an enthusiastic devotion to Christ. Heart faith has this immediate response, this immediate obedience to Christ. Heart faith has this I'm all in spirit, full surrender, full submission to Christ. And a man 
who has only had belief, he believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He believes that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. But a man who only has head belief will gladly sign any statement of faith, conservative, that, 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 that he believes the Bible 100%. But with only head belief, there's such a difference between a person who has heart belief, heart faith rather, heart faith, because the man who has heart faith he lives a life of fulfillment and inner joy. He dies the death of a loved son of God. And, and he enters heaven for an eternity of joyful bliss. You know, I told that to a, a Lyft driver yesterday. I said, you know, about, he, he was telling me that he goes to Catholic church every day for mass and stuff like that. And I was telling him the difference between head belief and hard faith. And I said, you know, he dies the death of a, of a loved son of God. And he stopped me. He says, what does that mean? to die the death of a loved son of God. And I explained to him, a man who only has head belief, he lives a life that is essentially depressing. It's depressing to be able, I just told you I bought all those shoal things because I counted down about how long I figured I was going to live. People, everybody does that. Everybody does that. When somebody dies, the first question you ask is, how old was he? And you're thinking, how old am I? How do I compare? You know? <laughs> That's natural. That's, that's what you do. If there is, if in this life we only have hope, as Paul said, we are of most men most miserable. Put it another way, if this is all there is, we are of most men most depressed. Because you build, you build, you build for what? To see it all fall apart? You build the sandcastle till the, till the tide comes in and the, and, the, and, the, and the water destroys it all? You know, is, is, is that all there is, Alfie? You know? But, but the, so to live, to have only had belief is to live a life that's basically depressing and sorrowful. To, it's to die the death of an outcast from God, and it's to enter hell for an eternity of miserable punishment. So in verse 39, when Christ said, come and see, and in verse 46, when, when Philip uh, said to Nathaniel, come and see, it's just a world of difference between what, 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 what they were saying. Don't just believe, but come and see. And it's interesting, they didn't say go and see. They said come and see. Come and see means come with me. Come with me and see. Whereas go and see means go alone, see for yourself. When Christ said come and see, and when Philip said, come and see, they were both saying they would accompany them. They would be with them. They were both saying that they, they'd go along with them. And, and so come and see means to come with me, as in Isaiah 2.3, Isaiah 2.3. 2, Many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. So Philip says, come and see, and he's saying, don't just listen to me. Let Christ speak to you directly. And that's a valuable message today from, from Philip's words in, in verse 46, come and see. Because the message behind that, come and see, is don't be happy and content just listening to others teach and talk about Christ. Come and see for yourself by hearing Christ speak directly to you. The parallel message with come and see is go and ask. And, and, you know, come to Christ, see for yourself, go to Christ, ask him to speak to you with his, with, with his mouth. So the message of come and see is, is, is don't, be, don't be happy with traditional Christian talk. Don't be content with secondhand information about Christ. Go to Christ directly, hear him speak to you personally, get from him firsthand information. That's the whole message behind come and see. So Christ came to seek and to save lost Israel. And when he came, during this time when he was calling his disciples, and they were gonna become apostles there, Israel was in a state of tremendous darkness. 
tremendous darkness. God said about Israel that they had forgotten that Jehovah was their resting place, where they were to rest their heart, their soul. Jeremiah 50, verse 6, Jeremiah 50, verse 6. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They've turned them away on the mountains. They've gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. The rabbis, they're the ones who are responsible for making the Jewish people lost. The rabbis did then what they do today. They load the people with heavy burdens of you gotta do this and you can't do that, as they tell them that the way to God is through food. You can't eat that food. You can't eat that fish and dove and that fish and scales. You can't eat the pork. You can't eat the pork. You can't eat, you, you can't eat uh, seafood. You can't eat uh, milk and, and meat together. And, oh, yeah, but you, know, you can eat this. And, you know, this and that's why I have a hat that, that I wear when the Israelis come and it says KL on it. It says kosher liberated. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> they ask me, do you eat shrimp? And I put my hat on. I say, I'm kosher liberated. Yeah, I'm shrimp. <laughs> and also the do's and don'ts on the Sabbath, how you have to, oh, you can't, you, you got to unscrew the light bulb in the refrigerator. It's work if you open the refrigerator, the light bulb, you can't have that. You know, many, many things, many, many things. How you have to pray, the direction you have to face, the words you have to speak, the wor- what you have to put on, the tefillin, all these things. And they make the people essentially miserable with works, 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 works. And so God said that all of that focus on religious duties have made the people, the Jewish people here, commit two evils. He said two evils in in Jeremiah 2.13. Jeremiah 2.13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. So the first evil is that Judaism has made the people forsake Jehovah, uh, Jehovah Jesus, as a source of life. The second evil is that Judaism has made the people work and, and, and in the end have no reservoir, nothing to draw on. And God uses an example of a cistern and a, and a broken cistern. And that's kind of relevant right now because living down in Loretto, it's really hot, it's a desert, water is kind of, imp- it is very important. And we're building, right, right now we're building uh, in, in the retreat house for, for, for the Bible retreats, we're building a cistern under the garage that will hold 20,000 gallons. That's a big cistern, essentially the whole garage underneath it. And Loretto gets, Loretto gets very hot, especially right now. And sometimes, the city turns the water off. You know, this is what happens down there. They turn the water off. You know. the, the, the couple of mayors before, he promised all the poor people up in Miramar, if you vote for me, I'll give you money. And so he got, they voted for him. He became mayor. So when the federal government from Mexico City sent him the money for pay the, 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 the water, the electric bill for the wells, he, he turned the water off and gave it to the people in Miramar. So we didn't have water for a month. So anyway, so that's, that's you, know, you need a cistern to rely on. So right now we're carefully going over how this new cistern is going to be made and what the materials are that are going to be used to seal this cistern so it, so it doesn't leak. And, and then when it's done, it'll be under the garage and there'll be this aluminum plate closed over it. And so the cistern is, is, is not going to be seen. You're not going to see it. And you just need to have confidence that it's holding water, that it's got water, because when the time comes, when the city turns off the water, you need to be assured that there's going to be water in the cistern, and you only know that when the time comes and, and there's no water, and you, and you turn it on, and you have water, you don't. So in the same way, a spiritual cistern, no one can see if a person has God or doesn't have God, but the person needs God at the crisis time in his life. And the only reliable cistern is heart faith, heart faith, life with 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 Jesus. And anything anything less than that, anything like head belief in in, in Jesus or religion based on works, 
such as, such as Judaism, such as Catholicism, such as religions, is a cistern that has leaked out all of its water. And when the critical time comes of, you know, a, 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 of no water crisis, when that comes, broken cisterns are only head belief and, and it's a cistern that has no water. Now, Philip, what Philip does there is very significant. With, with Nathaniel in John 1 45 verse 45 verse 45 Philip finds Nathaniel saith unto him we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph when Philip said when Philip said this what Philip actually said what he said was we have found him we have found him that's what we say to the lost we have found him and the question Nathaniel could ask Philip is the same question as the lost can ask us, which is, how do you know that you found him? How do you know that Jesus is the Messiah and that Jesus is, is God? And so there are three answers to that question. The, we know that we have found him by the, by the, the voice of the Bible, by the, by the testimony of Scripture. He, Jesus matches the, what the scriptures say uh, about who the Messiah is and who God is. So he lines up. So what Philip told Nathaniel is that they, they found the Messiah in Jesus because Jesus lined up with the scriptures of Moses and the prophets. That's what he was saying in verse 45. Verse 45, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth. And, 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 um, and for example, for example, in Psalm 2, very important psalm. Psalm 2 is very important very, uh, uh, with regard to who Jesus is. Psalm 2 ends by saying in verse 12, verse 12, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So we learn he, this is the son. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. This is the son who has to be worshipped. Uh, Isaiah 9.6, Isaiah 9.6 speaks about unto us a child is born. We get the idea. Child is born. Unto us a son is given. Again, we have a son mentioned here. And this son has the government on his shoulders. This son has the name, who was called Wonderful Counselor. This son has the name called The Mighty God. This son has the name called The Everlasting Father and The Prince of Peace. So, so he's lining up Jesus with the scriptures and seeing. We know we found him by, by the fact that he lines up with the Bible. Second, we know that we found him, and Nathaniel know he found him, by his own words. He claimed, Jesus claimed, to be the Messiah and the God of Israel. In John 4, 26, John 4, 26, when he was speaking to a, a, a Gentile Samaritan woman, and the woman in John 4.25, John 4.25 says, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he has come, he'll tell us all things. Jesus saith unto, unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So he's saying, I am the Messiah. In John 8.58, John 8.58, Jesus saith unto them, he's speaking to the Jewish people, Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was I am. He's claiming to be God. That's when they took up stones, tried to kill him. So we know that we, we found Jesus, we found, we found the Messiah by, the old, by his own words, by the words of Jesus. But we also know, that's the second way. The third way, we also know we found him by our own experience, by our own experience with Jesus himself, who was talking about heart faith and going directly to Jesus in 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our eyes have handled of the word of life, the life was manifested, we've seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested unto us. He's talking about a personal experience. Of course, he had a different experience than we have seeing and hearing directly, but nevertheless, by faith, when we read the Bible and interact with Jesus, it's just as real. We've come and we've seen for ourselves, as the hymn says, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. So, 
Philip comes to Nathanael and he tells them that they found the Messiah in Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth, and and it's interesting. Nazareth when 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 Nathanael hears Philip, the only word he hears is Nazareth. He, this just shocks him. Remember, I told you if I was going to write another book, I'd write it called Shocked. You know, so and so Nathanael is shocked. He's shocked, and his response is. In verse 46, verse 46, And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip saith unto him, Come and see. So before Nathanael had even seen or heard Jesus for himself, Nathanael makes a judgment that Jesus is no good because Jesus comes from Nazareth. Okay? And see, so to come to a decision about a person before knowing anything more about that person other than he comes from this, from, from wherever, it's, it's like, oh, Henry, Henry, Henry the black man. The black man? Can there be any good black person? Oh, Barry the Jew. The Jew? Can there be any good Jew? And, 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 and that's the same as Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth? Can there be any good person who comes from Nazareth? So there's one word to describe those types of conclusions before meeting the person. There can be no good person who's black, there can be no per good Jew, there can be no good person from Nazareth, and that one word is prejudice, that's all. It's just pure and simple prejudice. Prejudice blinds a person as a black, a, a black no, I won't consider him. A Jew, oh no. You know, it wasn't very long ago that houses in La Jolla Houses in La Jolla had written in their deeds as my cousin's house in Connecticut, her beach house, had the same thing written in her deed, the same as, and it was, this house may not be owned by the term a Negro or a Hebrew. That's how they call black people Negro. That's how they call Jews Hebrews. Well, the same as a person from Nazareth. No, we won't even, we won't consider him. No, we won't, we won't consider him. To refuse to consider a person because of his race or where he comes from is prejudice. And God said that God was the object of prejudice in, in Isaiah 1.3. Isaiah 1.3, where God said, The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. So when God says, that, that, the, that the Jewish people are prejudiced against him, my people will not consider. We could picture a black person leaving a human resources at a company and being asked, so how'd it go, how'd it go? And a black person says, I tried. They wouldn't even consider me. Once they knew that I was black, I was, it was out the door for me. Same way we can see God walking away from the Jewish people and, and someone asking God, so how'd it go, how'd it go? And God responding, I tried, but they wouldn't even consider me. Once they knew I was from Nazareth, it was out the door for me. It was John 1.11, John 1.11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. In La Jolla, the, the, the prejudice was a symptom of, of, uh, of Negro hatred and of Jew hatred. And the prejudice here is Jesus hatred. And this is the biggest problem that we face at Israel Restoration when we're trying to bring Jewish people to Jesus, the problem of Jesus hatred, prejudice, which is, which is, which is, which is why, you know, I have these cards. Somewhere I have these cards, not this card, I have other cards. Anyway, I have these cards that say, um, prejudice counselor, Tom Cantor, specializing in overcoming prejudice. That's my card. Okay. And, and, and that's what we see in the first response of Nathaniel to Jesus prejudice that drove his statement in verse 46, verse 46, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? But, uh, but, but fortunately, this is the good news, fortunately, Nathaniel was able to overcome his Jesus prejudice, and that's what we want to see, that's what we're trying to see, because if any person, if any Jewish person or any person is going to live that life of fulfillment and happiness and not the life of depression and sorrow, he must overcome his Jesus prejudice, as Nathaniel did. 
If any person is going to die the death of a loved son of God and not die the death of an outcast from God, he must overcome his Jesus prejudice as Nathaniel did. If any Jewish person or any person is going to be welcomed into heaven for an eternity of, of, uh, of joyful happiness forever, uh, 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 instead of entering into hell for an eternity of a miserable punishment, he's got to overcome his Jesus prejudice as Nathaniel did. So it's of vital importance to see how did this happen? How did Nathaniel overcome his Jesus prejudice? Well, the first step in Nathaniel's recovery from his fatal Jesus prejudice was <coughs> in verse 45, wasn't Nathanael. It was Philip in verse 45. Philip findeth Nathanael. If there was no Philip going after Nathanael, Nathanael doesn't recover from his Jesus prejudice and it's very bleak. It all started with God putting into the heart of Philip the desire to go find Nathanael. Nathanael's recovery from his Jesus prejudice started with Philip, who loved Nathaniel, who cared about Nathaniel's eternity. And that's what God wants to do with us. God wants to lay on our hearts a lost person who needs to recover from his Jesus prejudice. And God wants us to be a, a Philip and go find them. And go find them. You know, those summer blitzers can't underestimate what they did. They cared for those hundreds of thousands of Jewish people that they spent those 12 weeks in hot, blistering sun out there in the East Coast and down in Mexico City. They went, the, they, 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 they went to them this last summer because, because in the chapter about reaching lost Jewish people, which is in Romans chapter 10, God says, in the context of reaching Jewish people, Got Romans 10, 13, Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. God looked at the feet of each one of those summer blitzers and he said, I see beautiful feet. And, and, and when we go to a lost person to tell them about Jesus, God looks at our feet and he says, beautiful, beautiful. And when Philip went to Nathaniel, God said about Philip's feet, now there are some beautiful feet right there. And Philip, Philip told him that he found the Messiah and God in Jesus. Philip just told Nathaniel that he had personally experienced Jesus. And when Philip told Nathaniel that he firstly had, Philip had experienced in Jesus Christ, Philip was telling him that, that he really found him. And then Philip was pushed back. Philip, you can imagine Philip, he's, he's very excited, very, got a lot of enthusiasm here. He's gonna go bring his friend. And Philip feels these hands in his chest with his friend Nathaniel pushing them back with Jesus prejudice, saying, there can't be any good thing come out of Nazareth. And, and, Nathaniel, and Nathaniel said that because, uh, 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 Nathaniel said that about Nazareth because Nathaniel, because Nathaniel was thinking, Nazareth? It's in Galilee. Galilee is such a despised area, it was called Galilee of the Gentiles. A despised region of, of of Israel. Nathaniel was thinking, Nazareth? It's too small. It's an insignificant little market town. It, it, it's, it, nobody important like the Messiah could come out of there. You know, the, Nathaniel's thinking, Nazareth? I never heard any celebrity come out of there. And Nathaniel is thinking, Nazareth? There's not one mention of Nazareth in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Old Testament. Well, there's Nazareth. And, and, you know, it's, it, 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 and, and, and and, and it was a despised place. As a matter of fact, when I was in Israel, I spoke to this one uh, Orthodox observant man um, at the Wailing Wall. 
And I talked to him about Jesus. Every time I said Jesus, he spit. But he refused to say the word Jesus, and instead he called him the Hanatsri, you know, the, 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 the person, the one from Nazareth. You know, that's putting him. So these were the arguments that were loaded in, in Nathaniel's mind, that were loaded in Nathaniel's statement to Philip, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And, and that was a valid question. That was a valid question that was put to Philip. And that question really put Philip on the spot. You know, I mean, I mean, that question put the ball in Philip's court. And the question is, well, what are you going to say, Philip? What are you going to, you know, what are you, what are you, what are you going to, what are you going to do? And at that point, Philip, uh, at that point, the question is, is Philip going to try to defend the honor of the city of Nazareth? Is that what he's going to do? It, it, is Philip going to, 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 to respond to Nathaniel and say, no, Nathaniel, you got it all wrong. Nazareth is not that bad a place. And, and, and there can be something good that comes out of Nazareth. He, and, go on, and is he going to follow that rabbit trail down about Nazareth? Uh, that would have been foolish for, for, for Philip to, to, to defend how something good could come out of Nazareth and talk about Nazareth. That question was a trap for Philip. And he was wise to stay away from it, not fall into that trap of trying to explain how something good could have come out of Nazareth. So when Philip, so when Philip wisely did not respond to that question of how something good could come out of Nazareth, Philip becomes an example for us, an example for us. Sometimes we're challenged with the question of, you know, I love my pet dog. Is my pet dog going to heaven? You know, or, or some other question, which is not where we want to go. You know, we, we don't want to talk about the subject of Fido going to heaven or not. And so Philip instead leaves off from talking about Nazareth, and Philip just says, says to Nathaniel in verse 46, verse 46, well, as for your question about anything coming good from out of Nazareth, come and see, come and see. That was the best answer that Philip could give to his friend Nathaniel. It was an answer of, I, I don't want to talk about the city of Nazareth. I, I want to talk about Jesus. And all I want you to do is to come to Jesus and see for yourself. Then the question of, of, uh, of can there any good thing come out of Nazareth will just kind of, it, it'll grow strangely dim in, in, in the light of Jesus. So, this interplay between Philip and Nathaniel is very important because what we see here with Philip is that when Philip said to Nathaniel in verse 46, come and see, in response to Nathaniel's question about anything come, good come out of Nazareth, Philip is not going to argue the question. He's, he's refusing. He gives the only possible answer to Nathaniel's question, which was, you ask me? If anything good can come out of Nazareth, my answer is come and see whether Jesus is a good thing or not. And if Jesus is a good thing, and if he came out of Nazareth, well, then the question has answered itself. So it's interesting because in John 4, Jesus will encounter a Samaritan woman by a well. And that, that woman will rightly say to Jesus, in John chapter 4, verse 9, John chapter 4, verse 9, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto, unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. She was right in that the, 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 the Jews hated the Samaritans. So the, the Jews had some Samaritan hatred. And the Samaritans hated the Jews. So the Samaritans had Jew hatred. So the Samaritans had Jew hatred. They had a Jew hatred prejudice. And in the end of that encounter, the woman said to Jesus in John 4, 19, John 4, 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. So now the woman is so excited and she runs back into the city and she tells the men about Jesus, the Jew. And now the men were thinking, can there any good thing come out of the Jews? Can there, can there be a good Jew? And the woman didn't go there. She didn't go there, just, in, 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 just like Philip. Instead, the woman stepped over the prejudice question in exactly the same way as Philip did when the woman said in, in John 4, 29, John 4, 29, come see 
a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Messiah, the Christ? And that's just like Nathaniel accepted Philip's invitation, come and see. And the supposed, uh, so the men of Samaria had accepted the, 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 the invitation of the woman, come and see the supposed good Jew. And in John 4.30, John 4.30, John 4.30, then they went out of the city and came unto him. And after the men saw the good Jew, Jesus, they said, they overcame their prejudice. They said in verse 42, verse 42, they said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. When they, when they said that, the woman had very wisely fulfilled her role of pointing others to Christ and then stepping out of the way or being pushed out of the way, however you want to look at it. Get out of the way. So what happened was, when the Samaritan men came to Jesus was something that happened just between the Samaritan men and Christ himself without the woman. And, and just as when Nathaniel came to Jesus, Philip had wisely fulfilled his role of pointing Nathaniel to Christ, and then Philip stepped out of the way. So that everything that happens from here on out in the chapter, we don't see Philip's name anymore. So what happened next was just between Nathaniel and Christ himself without Philip. And if you and I are going to fulfill our role in life, it will be from us inviting and pointing people to Christ and then stepping out of the way so that they can go to Christ and interact with Christ alone themselves. Okay, now Nathaniel, he's willing. He's willing to come along with his friend Philip and see for himself. And, and this, is, this is the scene now. And Nathaniel... Philip's kind of faded out of the picture now, and Nathaniel, and so verse 47, verse 47, Jesus does, it doesn't say Jesus saw Nathaniel and Philip, it says Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and saith unto him, behold an Israelite in whom is no guile. Now the Greek word for guile is the word dolos, dolos, we get our word decoy from that, and which has the meaning of deceit, deceit. So when Christ saw Nathanael coming to him, Christ said that Nathanael was a real Israelite in whom was no decoy or in whom was no deceit. And what Christ meant by that was that here was an Israelite who was ready to be recovered from his Jesus prejudice, his Jesus hatred prejudice. And for any person to be saved from God's eternal anger, he needs to be a person that's willing to be recovered from his Jesus hatred prejudice. Not like the American that a Filipino pastor told me about in the Philippines when he came and told me that he, he, he met this American who said, I'd rather go to hell than to believe in Jesus. So when Nathaniel came to Christ, Christ knew that, he knew what he said, you know, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Christ did not say, oh, how do you do? You know, I'm from Nazareth, and I understand that you think that nothing good could come out of Nazareth. He didn't start off the conversation that way. That was not a good way to, that was not a good opener. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Christ had, didn't have one word to say about Nathaniel's prejudice. As a matter of fact, Christ said nothing about any of Nathaniel's sins. He just praised Nathaniel for his willingness to be recovered from his prejudice, for being without deceit in coming to Christ. And that shows us that if any person shows any movement toward Christ, Christ has nothing but encouragement for that person, not loading a lot of sins on him, you know, not, not making him feel miserable. <laughs> it reminds me of Groucho Marx one time. He met a Catholic priest, and he, he said, uh, and the Catholic priest said, Aren't you, are, you, are you Groucho Marx? 
and, uh, and, and, and Groucho Marx says, yeah, yes, I am. He says, well, I want to thank you for bringing such happiness into the world. And Groucho Marx said to him, well, I want to thank you for taking away such happiness in the world. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, by loading all the sin, sins. Okay. But encouragement. This is Christ. Encouragement for the persons. So really, when you look at all the disciples, all 12 of them, and you see Nathaniel. Nathaniel had the most prejudice against Christ because, because he came from Nazareth. But, when Christ, but Christ didn't even mention uh, the, this, this problem. It, it shows us how Christ is willing to excuse. He's willing to excuse. Luke 12.10, Luke 12.10 12, says, Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. Now, we know where Nathaniel was from himself. It, it actually, it's identified in John 21, 2, John 21, 2, where it says, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. So, Christ did not, Nathaniel with, oh, hello, tell me, can there any good thing come out of Cana of Galilee? You know, he didn't start that one either. He just forgave his prejudice, it's wonderful, and he calls him an Israelite indeed. Now, when Christ called Nathaniel an Israelite indeed, he was making a difference between Israelites or, or Jewish people who are, some Jewish people are Israelite indeed, and some Jewish people are not Israelites indeed. And this is what we're told in Romans 9, 6, Romans 9, 6, where it says, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because are they the seed of Abraham, are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. So this is a very important passage here in, in, the, in, the, in these three chapters, Romans 9, 10, 11, with the, the, deals with the, the Jews. But this, this, this statement in Romans 9, 6, they are not all Israel which are of Israel, is talking about what Christ is saying to Nathanael when he calls him an Israelite indeed. In other words, just because a person is uh, born Jewish, his mother was Jewish, father, parents, whatever, and, or from the seed of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, the word seed there, Greek word seed, is the word sperma, from which we get sperm, because the seed of Abraham. That does not mean that they are followers of Abraham or children of Abraham, as Romans 9, 7 puts it, Romans 9, 7, neither because they are the seed of Abraham, the sperma of Abraham, are they all children. Ishmael, was the seed of Abraham. He was the sperma of Abraham. But Ishmael was not a follower of Abraham. He was not a child of Abraham. Isaac was both the seed and the child of Abraham. Esau was the seed of Abraham, was the seed of Isaac, seed of Abraham. But Esau was also not a follower or a child of Abraham and, and Isaac. Jacob was both the seed and then and the child of Abraham and Isaac. So Jacob was an Israelite indeed. And Jacob, but he didn't start out that way. Jacob didn't start out that way as a follower of God. There was, uh, there was in Jacob with that latter incident out in the desert where he made his deal with God. He said, if you do this, 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 then you can be my God. So God was very patient. But what there was in the, in the, in the life of Jacob was an, an ice of hesitation. There was an ice of doubt in Jacob. Is this good for me, for me to have him be my master? But that ice of hesitation, that ice of doubt, it got melted away that, that one night in Genesis 32. Very monumental night, Genesis 32, when he got the name Israel in Genesis 32, 24, Genesis 32, 24, Jacob was left alone and, and there wrestled a man, that would be Jesus, with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. 
And he said, let me go, the man said, let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go. Jacob said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. So Jacob's name on that night, Genesis 32, was changed to Israel. And Jacob was told that he had prevailed with men. And the first man that Jacob prevailed with was himself, because Jacob prevailed and overcame his own prejudice against God, who in this case was, was Jesus here. And after that monumental night, Jacob emerged a broken man, a surrendered man, and a man with a new name of Israel. Now, the Jewish people call themselves Israel. But an Israelite indeed, or a true Israelite, is a Jewish person who has prevailed and overcome his own prejudice against Jesus. This is the same as today as many people who call themselves Christians, but they're not really followers of Christ. It's just a name. And the Jewish people call themselves Israel, but, it's, but they're not followers of Abraham or Jacob. It's just a name, as, uh, as most Jewish people are not. And, 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 and this interplay came to the, to the front when Jesus was interacting with the Jewish leaders in John 8, 37, John 8, 37, where John 8, 37, where Jesus said to them, I know that you are Abraham's seed, Abraham's sperma. I know that you are Abraham's seed, he said in John 8, 37. And two verses down, John 8, 39, John 8, 39, he said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Or put it another way, what is an Israelite indeed? It's what he's talking about. What is an Israelite indeed? Romans 2.29. Romans 2.29. He is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. When a Jewish person overcomes his prejudice against Jesus, that Jewish person becomes a Jew inwardly, and that Jewish person then becomes a representation of, of the ideal for all Jewish people. When a Jewish person overcomes his prejudice against Jesus, that Jewish person becomes like just a little prophecy. He's like a little speaking prophecy for the ideal when all of the Jewish people will one day overcome their prejudice against Jesus, and that will be the day of the fulfillment of Romans 11.26, Romans 11.26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come forth uh, out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So, Nathaniel, with his prejudice of can there any good thing come out of Nazareth, he starts off with guile. He started off with guile, but Philip exposed Nathaniel's prejudice by in essence saying to Nathaniel, can you just set aside your nothing good can come out of Nazareth? Nazareth prejudice and just come and see for yourself. Can you do that? And that was when the guile of prejudice was driven out of Nathaniel. And that's why when Christ saw Nathaniel, he said, behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. That was really Christ saying, now here's Nathaniel who has just become an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile because Philip drove the guile or the prejudice out of Nathaniel. So Nathaniel comes to Christ, and, he, and, he, and he, first he had that ice of hesitation, that ice of doubt. But after he speaks with Jesus, or Jesus speaks to him, that ice of hesitation and doubt just melted away. And that's how Nathaniel overcame his prejudice. And after he overcame his prejudice, Nathaniel makes one of the most wonderful, clearest proclamations of who Jesus Christ is. In verse 49, verse 49, Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Now, seeing Nathanael now in his state of complete recovery from his Jesus prejudice, very encouraging. Very encouraging for the doubter and the arguer today. It means 
that all of that energy that Nathaniel had with this, ah, nothing good can come out of Nazareth, a lot of energy there. All of that, that energetic, uh, that energy that drives the doubter and the arguer today, when recovered from prejudice, that person has the potential to take that same energy and become a great evangelist for tomorrow. Now, when Nathaniel heard Christ call him an Israelite, indeed, Nathaniel and Christ, they never met before. So Nathaniel wonders, how, how, does, he, how does he know me? In verse 48, verse 48, Nathaniel saith unto him, Whence or how knowest thou me? And Christ responds to Nathaniel by telling him in verse 48, verse 48, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now, we don't know what was happening under that fig tree. We don't, have, we don't have the history about Nathaniel under the fig tree. But obviously, when Nathaniel was under a fig tree, something very important was happening there. Probably, it was under a fig tree when Nathaniel was really reaching out to God. I don't know. But Nathaniel probably was deeply seeking God under this fig tree. It was something very important. So that when Christ said that he, that he saw him, saw Nathaniel under the fig tree, that just blew Nathaniel away. He just was blown away. Nathaniel probably thought, I thought I was all alone under the fig tree. Or maybe he thought he was alone with God. But obviously, when, when Nathaniel was under that fig tree, something that Nathaniel was do doing, he didn't tell anybody else. It was a secret. It was a deep secret. And, and, and it was maybe he was in a meditation on God. I don't know. But when Christ said that he saw Nathaniel under the fig tree, that convinced Nathaniel that Christ must be God. And Nathaniel said in, in verse 49, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. What Nathaniel realized about Jesus is that all of his thoughts were all completely exposed and open before Jesus. Just like we read in Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And what that's saying is that Jesus knows everything about everyone. Even though everyone is not aware of the fact that Jesus knows everything about them, but it's, it doesn't change the fact. It doesn't change the truth. And this is what Jehovah Jesus said about a Persian king named Cyrus. When God spoke to Cyrus in Isaiah 45, verse 4, Isaiah 45, verse 4, this is what God said to Cyrus, the Persian king. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name, I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Cyrus played a very key role in the history of the Jews because it was Cyrus that freed the Jews from slavery. And, and it was Cyrus who sent them back to the land of Israel with resources and a command, build a temple again. And God said that not only did God call Cyrus by name, but God said he named Cyrus Cyrus. And what God was saying to Cyrus is that that, that he knew Cyrus very well. And then God added that little phrase at the end of Isaiah 45, 4. Isaiah 45, 4, he says, though thou hast not known me. This, in essence, is what Christ was telling Nathaniel in verse 48. It was like Christ was saying to Nathaniel, Nathaniel, I know everything about you. I know all your thoughts. I know all your words. I know everything you do. I see you when you're under fig trees. I know you better than you know yourself, although you don't know me. And it was that knowledge that Christ knew Nathaniel better than Nathaniel knew himself that just broke Nathaniel into a state of just submission and worship of Christ. And how many there are in the world today that Christ could say, I know that person, but he doesn't know me. And that's our mission in life, to change as much as we can for others that Christ knows him, but he doesn't know Christ, into a statement of Christ knows him, and he knows Christ. That's what we're trying to do. In that proclamation, Nathaniel has made three 
important statements, what he says. First, he's called Christ rabbi. So when Nathaniel calls Christ, Christ rabbi, it wasn't just a term of respect. Rabbi comes from the Hebrew word rab, high one, my high one. So the, 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 which is why I don't, I try not to call them Jewish rabbis and Judaism rabbis. So the term rabbi means the one who is elevated above me as a teacher. And it's possessive, my high one. So unless there's a rabbi teaching about Jesus, I'm not going to call him a rabbi. But when Nathaniel calls Jesus rabbi, Nathaniel is dedicating himself to be a follower of Jesus as his rabbi, which he did. He became one of the apostles. And then, second, Nathaniel called Jesus, Thou art the Son of God. Now, that title, the Son of God, is not often seen in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Scriptures that Nathaniel had. It's, it's not. It's very rare. But it's seen enough to be able to put the pieces together. And as I mentioned, Psalm 2 is the critical passage. The critical passage in Psalm 2, verse 7, Psalm 2, verse 7, where, um, <clears throat> where the person speaking says that God declares a decree. I will declare the decree. The Lord said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish by the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. What is seen in Psalm 2 is there is a person who's speaking, and, he's, and, and he has been called the son, the son of God. God has called him my sour, my son. So he's the son of God. And this, this son of God in Psalm 2 is given all the earth for his possession. And this Son of God is the great judge of all. And this Son of God decides himself who is going to be cast into hell and who's going to be not enter into heaven. And it's based on his anger. If, if the Son of God, the Son of God in Psalm 2 is angry, then the person perishes, is cast into hell. And then in Psalm 2, people are commanded, essentially, don't make him mad. Don't make him mad. They're, they're commanded, honor the Son, serve the Son, worship the Son of God. And then they're told, you are blessed if you put your trust in the Son of God. And so in Psalm 2, it's the Son of God who's speaking. And the Son of God says that there's there, there's another person in Psalm 2. The Lord God who said unto me, Thou art my son. So clearly from Psalm 2, there's more than one person who makes up the Godhead, at least two. Now there's, there's, there's three. There's three persons in the Godhead. And, it, and there are places, little pictures, little windows that we get in the Old Testament where we can see all three together. In one of those places in Isaiah 48, Isaiah 48, 12, Isaiah 48, 12, where a call is made out to Israel, Isaiah 48, 12 and 13, and then we're going to go to verse 16. So Isaiah 48, 12 and 13 and then 16. Isaiah 48, 12 says, Hearken unto me, O Jacob, and Israel my called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. Verse 16. Come ye near unto me, hear ye this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I, and now the Lord God and his Spirit hath sent me. So in those verses, 
The person who is speaking is the God of Israel. He says in verse 1, Hearken unto me, O Jacob, and Israel, my called. I am he, I am the first, I am the last. That same God of Israel it, it said that he is the great creator of all in verse 2, uh, Isaiah 45, 2. Isaiah 45, 2. Mine hand hath also laid the foundation of the earth. And that same God of Israel invites Israel to come near and get to know him. And then he said that he's there with two other persons called the Lord God and the Spirit of God. And those two other persons, the Lord God and the Spirit of God, are sending him as the God of Israel. Uh, Isaiah 45, 16. Isaiah 45, 16. Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was. There am I, and now the Lord God and his Spirit hath sent me. So it's that verse <coughs> in Isaiah 45, 16, where all three persons of the Godhead are seen. And Psalm 2, 7 where the God of Israel is seen as the, as, the, as, 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 the, as the great judge of the earth, who's also the Son of God. So Nathaniel calls Jesus the Son of God. He's put it all together. And he's saying to Jesus, you are the God of Israel. You are the God of Israel. Now when Nathaniel called Jesus, then the third thing he called Jesus was the King of Israel, the King of Israel. And Nathaniel meant that he was the God of Israel. The King of Israel is the God of Israel. So when he calls Jesus the king of Israel, Nathaniel is saying that Jesus was the Messiah or the God or God based on Jeremiah 23.5. Jeremiah 23.5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely and this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So in that passage, God is called in Jeremiah 23, 5, the Lord, he's speaking, the Lord says that he's going to raise up a person who is going to be called the righteous branch, that this person will be the king who's going to judge the earth. And this king is going to save Israel and that name that the Jewish people will call this king who saves them, they will call him the Lord, who is our righteousness. So when Nathanael calls Jesus the king of Israel, he's calling Jesus the king from Jeremiah 23, 5, who will be known to the Jewish people as the Lord, who is also our righteousness. And then Jesus tells Nathanael in the last two verses of this chapter, Verses 50 and 51, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So Jesus told Nathanael that because he worshipped Jesus, that Nathanael was going to see heaven open up. Open up. So you're going to see heaven open up. Because he's... And, and, and Nathaniel has just called Christ the Son of God, or God the Son. And it's interesting that after Nathaniel refers to Christ as God, that Christ doesn't deny that, that he's God, but Christ refers to himself in verse 51, verse 51, as the Son of Man. Not the Son of God, but the Son of Man. And this sent the message back to Nathaniel that yes, Christ is fully God, but yes, Christ became fully man. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for, the, for letting us see the, all of this conversation between you and, and Nathaniel. And we pray, Lord, that <clears throat> you would give us the, uh, the willingness of Nathaniel to uh, cast off all prejudice against you, Lord Jesus. And that you would also, Lord, uh, give us the full surrender of Nathaniel and, uh, and, and uh, his openness to proclaim you as you are. In Jesus' name, amen.